What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Be The Number. I am your host, Spencer Aguiar, and I could not be more excited to be joined by my guest this week, Joel Shrek. Joel is someone I consider to be one of the best high-stakes DFS players in the industry, and his knowledge stretches throughout various sports, including PGA, NFL, and college football. You can find Joel every Tuesday at 5 o'clock Pacific time on the live golf show that he does over at Win Daily Sports with Sia Najad and myself. And you can also follow him on Twitter at DraftMasterFlex. Joel, how are you doing, my friend? Spencer, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you on here. I mean, like I kind of have my Mount Rushmore of people that I want to get on here with people that have been you know, very close with me and, and the wind daily team in general, like obviously there's a bunch of people there. Uh, I mentioned Sia who's crushing it across the board. He has an NFL show that he co-hosts over at CBS sports. Stick picks is my co-host of the better golf pod and is in that same tier of you as being one of the premier minds of nosebleed fantasy sports. Uh, Jason Mizrahi owns the company is involved in creating the new sharp app which is a game changer for avid gamblers. I, I would highly recommend downloading that app when you get a second, but I want to talk about your success a little bit before we move into the CJ cup uh, specifics of how much you have won don't need to be revealed. Although I will say to the listeners that you are no stranger to six figure scores, but give our, our viewers base a little bit of your background in DFS. And if you could any advice when it comes to building a bankroll up over time. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, you know, I've been thinking about that, you know, for a little bit, like how to kind of answer that. I'm a DFS, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, OG. I've been on DraftKings since, you know, the first months that they opened up. And, you know, I just love fantasy. So, you know, for years it was more like fun, right? It was just like, hey, let's build some lineups and get into it. And it wasn't until pretty recently, like the last two or three years, where I kind of became more serious with it and uh, went from just like a fun thing that, and when I say fun, I was still playing every sport on a nightly basis. So I was still playing a lot to where now I'm, I'm doing it more for uh, a living uh, and more, you know, professionally. And I will say with all fantasy sports and, and kind of uh, DFS angle, the most important thing is understanding how you play and what you're playing more so than knowing who the best player is on every slate, right? Because like, you know, you go into any golf tournament, right? We all know that John Rahm is one of the best players. That's no secret. Every single person who's entering a lineup knows that, right? So there's no edge by saying, I know John Rahm's the best, right? The edge comes by knowing who you're playing against and understanding the percentages of, oh, the possibilities of John Rahm not winning at this tournament and me not having him versus a field that he might be 30 or 40% owned is where you can start getting the edge. And that's where I found it to be way more profitable. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Like one of the biggest things that I try to stress for GPPs on this show is that playing to min cash is a surefire way to get raked off the site over time. As you were just saying with it, it's important to understand what kind of contest you are entering, where you need to be more or less aggressive. And of course, trying to leverage builds that are unique and create a chance to hit it big when you do put the right pieces together. Um, you know, I, I think that's something that everybody can get better at over time. I think that's something that you get better at the more that you play with it. Um, like one of the things we talk about on this show is, you know, single entry versus three max. I know that you, I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong here. You do, since you're playing such in the high stakes, you're obviously playing more of that single entry type build. Uh, correct. No, not necessarily. Um, I mix it up. I, I tend to go for the bigger GPPs. That is my preferred method of, of play. Um, I, I don't say that this is something you have to do, but for me, what works is, um, when you're playing, I'm very focused all week when I'm breaking down a tournament on GPP. So like, that's a lot of my mentality. And so like, it would be hard for me on like the last minute to shift to cash because I'm just really trying to think about this from one angle. And I would encourage people to just, it doesn't matter. You might, you might just be more of a cash person. That's fine. But I would try and develop some sort of consistency of how you want to break down a tournament from either a cash perspective or a GPP perspective, because when you start mixing the two, it gets to be blurry and that's when you can make mistakes. So I really hone in on whatever I'm doing. Like for me, it usually is GPP and I'm really focused on that. I don't kind of play both sides. Yeah. And I, I think that just goes to the general thing of what you're saying. It's just understanding what you're good at, what kind of contest you want to be playing. And there's nothing wrong with playing cash. It's going to be lucrative in the sense that it's 
maybe easier to build a bankroll. It's not so much relying on hitting a big score, but like if we are talking about GPPs, like you can't get yourself, you know, min caches over and over. Like you're going to have to take shots. You're going to have to figure out how to leverage builds with it. And I think that's the important thing is just understanding the contest. Like the more people that are in the contest, the more aggressive you're going to have to play with it. If you're looking at single entries where you don't have as many people, like chalk doesn't matter as much. And in cash, chalk matters zero. I, like you can play all the chalk plays and get completely around it. But uh, let's move forward into how we are going to construct those lineups this week. So as they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And the PGA Tour has adopted that moniker here by deciding to stay in town for back-to-back -back weeks to put on the CJ Cup. Uh, for reference sake, we were about 15 minutes away from where the tournament was held last week. And it's actually just a few neighborhoods down from where I live. But the host is going to be the Summit Club, 7,459 yards, Par 72, bent grass greens, 78 players, no cut event. Uh, as you know, Joel, I am someone that goes extremely in depth when it comes to trying to handicap a course, but it's nearly impossible to put pieces together this week with the fact that we are getting the venue for the first time in history. I guess I have a two-part question for you here. To start, how do you usually handle these weeks where data might not be as comprehensive as we are used to receiving? And the second question would be, did you notice anything at all when trying to take a deeper dive into the course? So um, as you might have already noticed, I'm definitely a half, a glass half full type of guy. So for me, the way I spin that is um, it's a good thing, right? Because not having the data means this. I don't have to second guess that if I'm not playing the longest driver on this course, then I'm making a mistake. Because, you know, even on the courses that requires length, it's not always the long hitters that are the top guys, right? It's a mix. And so a lot of times, because you know a course re requires some sort of either length or accuracy off the tee or something like that, you try and really funnel in those guys. Whereas for me, now it lets me look back and be like, okay, let's just go back to the basics, right? We don't need to over-prioritize any particular stat. We can just say who's playing well right now, um, who's in really good form, and then like, what do we always look for? The best iron players, things like that. So I'm just going to go back to the basics. I'm still going to look for the guys who are in good form, try and find value in terms of price on DraftKings, uh, and really keep it pretty basic from that perspective. Yeah, I think the value concept, whether that be from a DFS standpoint or a betting standpoint, is always the most important thing. Like you're always trying to find value, whether that be value against the market, value against the ownership when you're trying to leverage in spots. But uh, one of the things I try to do is in, in situations like this is to figure out what can be proven. So that's information like yardage. What is par? What kind of greens do we have? Uh, based on that answer, we can start to figure out how important will par five scoring be? Does distance look like it will come into play? Uh, maybe we can focus on putting for a specific green type. That's the easy way to get an initial answer. But I do think certain course architects build their properties in the same fashion all the time. And Tom Fazio is one of those people. So when I look at Fazio designs, there are a few courses that I think are decent comps. Uh, Shadow Creek would be one, which is the Vegas course used last year. And the second would be Caves Valley, won by Patrick Cantlay a few months ago during the BMW Championship. In reality, you can essentially use any Fazio track for reference, but I went through my models to try and find any corollary stats that stood out across the board, and I noticed most were usually nearly identical each time. Uh, deep bunkering will surround undulating fairways and greens. Three-putt avoidance typically means something since greens are large. I think when you add to the equation that the surface should be fast because of the Vegas heat, that it amplifies that notion even further. Uh, distance off the tee because the, the course is wide open and long iron play to account for some of the more extended shots that are required. Uh, there are other smaller factors that come into play, but this is one of the better tracks we could get, in my opinion, for having zero data at our disposal. So uh, just to get through a quick rundown here, I weighted my model as such. It's a 75-25 uh, split of 75% stats, 25% current form. From a statistical perspective, I started with total driving for 17.5%. That's an 80-20 split between distance over accuracy. I have par five birdie or better percentage for 17 and a half percent. I weighted bent grass. Uh, it's a weighted bent grass category for 15%, which essentially incorporates a 50, 50 split between strokes gain total on bent grass and strokes gain putting on bent grass. The goal for this one is to find out who likes the surface and then add putting into the mix. Uh, strokes gain total at easy courses for 12 and a half percent. This is like every single week on the PGA tour. Now it feels like another birdie fest weighted bunker play for 12 and a half percent. That is 70% sand save percentage from greenside sand traps and 30% GIR percentage from fairway bunkers. Players will be um, with more distance will be able to cut off the dog legs. 
So that is why I weighed the green side ones heavier, but playing out of the sand will be crucial no matter where it is. 10% on three putt avoidance plus around the green. That's 60% three putt avoidance and 40% around the green that goes into that weight. I think these are large surfaces, as I said, and the dried out uh, nature of them because of the Vegas heat does make them a little bit quicker. Uh, short game is going to matter with the undulation at the property. And then proximity from 175 plus yards for 15%. I think you can make an argument that altitude lowers the importance somewhat, uh, but some of the altitude information is a little overblown. We are higher than average when it comes to most states, especially those coastal courses. But Vegas is much lower than most other Nevada locations when looking at that stat. So I guess to simplify that, I'm looking for golfers that have distance off the tee, long iron proximity to account for these larger green complexes, a handful of short game stats, um, some sand safe percentage because of the deep bunkering. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Joel. I know that's kind of a long rundown with that. But if not, we can move into the actual pricing. The only other thing I would add for this week is that um... – you know, from what I've seen and looking at different data, that they, they tend to va devalue off the tee in terms of like, you know, you can only, you don't need to, if you miss your tee shots, you can probably recover. It's not going to be the worst thing. So, with that being said, that's almost a reason for me to target bad drivers, right? Because if they can still be competitive PGA golfers without being good off the tee, how much are they, how much better are they going to do in courses that, that won't penalize them? So, that's kind of a thing where I want to find those guys that tend to struggle off the tee or that might get messed at a course like this. Yeah. And I mean, that's essentially in, in a different way of what I did with it too. Like I don't have any off the tee data. I do have total driving. It is so weighted towards uh, uh, distance for it. I mean, 80% of that is distance. So I'm fine with the guy that's going to spray it a little bit off the tee. It's wide open. I don't think it's as penal out here. So I think Joel and I are essentially saying the same thing in a little bit of a different way here. And, and it's a second shot course, like at the end of the day, but uh, let's move forward into the top of the range here. So we have six guys that are priced over $10,000. Led by Ryder Cup top point scorer Dustin Johnson at 11,300. Justin Thomas is at 11,100. Colin Morikawa, 10,800. Xander Shoffley, 10,600. Jordan Speeth, 10,300. And Rory McIlroy, 10,100. Joel, this is obviously a no cut event, as I previously mentioned. Does, so, does that change how you construct your builds any? And uh, regardless of the answer of that, who do you like in this range? Yeah, so just to start, in terms of like breaking down the ranges in this tournament, I think it's important to note that like the last couple tournaments that we've broken down have been what I sometimes call JV tournaments, right? They're, they, they're, they're lacking a lot of the stars and the big names, and this is not that, right? We have all the guys back, all the stars, and it's just a little different way to build because there's a lot more really good golfers, whereas previous weeks um, – a lot of it tends to mesh together because there's not as big of a variance. Whereas here there will be, and there's also going to be clear value in the lower tiers as you know, some guys may be a bit mispriced and stuff like that. So I definitely am taking that type of stuff into account when, when making my build. And so when I start at this top tier, um, the first thing that stood out in my mind was that, and none of these guys are probably that much better than the next tier down. And so if you, I prefer a more competitive build or balance, and so for that reason, um, up in this top tier, there's I don't, it's not a lot to love. The two guys I, I would look at the most are DJ because his ownership is really low and Colin Morikawa just because the, when you're the best iron player in the world and, of course, with a lot of unknowns, right, the one thing we know is that he's going to get some really tight iron shots. So uh, I think that's kind of answering that question mark. But other than that, I think we can find better value at some lower tiers. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point that you just brought up that there's not a huge difference between these players in the group below. I mean, yes, there's a little bit of a difference, but it's not so much so. And um, I think you bring up an interesting point to this because, you know, it's a no cut tournament. They lend themselves to being more boom or bust. And I say that rather than stars and scrubs, because I think that narrative is so widely believed now in no cut events that you can actually gain some leverage with flatter builds, as you're mentioning. Um, but you know, the original point that I keep stressing here is that that needs to be done at some point, you have to take contrarian shots with your lineups at some point. Uh, the fact that we theoretically should get four rounds out of everyone adds to the aggressive approach, which is of course, assuming that somebody like Jason day and I don't go to Dave and busters during the middle of round one, but assuming we're going to get four rounds of everybody, it, it's a weird top of the board. That's difficult. I like your stance on Dustin Johnson here. 
My model believes a fair average ownership for him is about 17 to 20%. Uh, those numbers will change a little bit as more data enters the market, but we are currently seeing him around 10%. Uh, the price is 100% boosted because of his performance at the Ryder Cup, but I don't mind using him as a GPP play with that idea in mind. I, I don't think it makes sense for numerous reasons to pay the price tag in cash, uh, but Johnson has always excelled on these fast bent grass type properties where scoring is easy and distance matters. His long irons have continued to trend in the wrong direction, but any improvement there puts him very much in play. Uh, you could argue he is $500 to $1,000 overpriced. But that's perfectly acceptable if popularity doesn't follow the higher tag. It's one way to use the overpricing to your advantage. I don't have any problems with Thomas as long as the ownership doesn't go nuclear. I just think the no cut dynamic with him always um, is something to look at. And if the ownership's going to go wild, like I'm fine pivoting and going elsewhere. But he's number one in my model at easy courses. He's averaged 5.875 shots T to green over his last 12 uh, trackable starts. Morikawa, I am different with you on. I think Morikawa is trending towards being one of the highest owned players on the board. And that's fine on the surface, but I will be out on him in this spot for a couple reasons. And maybe it's because I am weighing distance a little bit more than you are. I understand that approach thing. And, you know, he ranks 69th in my model for putting, which contrary to popular belief is not nice in this situation. But uh, he's typically performed better when courses get more challenging. I think this is an easy course for him. Uh, for me, it's just, if he's going to be 25, 30%, and he's going to be in like that speed range for me where, uh, you know, he's like 20, 25th in my model. Like, I just think there's other spots to go. I think there's people in the nine thousands that make more sense. Uh, Xander's ownership is also going to be wild. He is number one from a statistical perspective. He is a no cut type player. I, I think that that makes sense, but you know, I'm kind of more inclined to try to pivot off of him and go somewhere also. Um, although I think there are situations, like I do want to stress, I think in single entry, he's fine. I, I think in three max builds, I think more of the problem comes like in these like millionaire maker type tournaments where it's just such big tournaments that like, it's going to be hard to win with a 30% owned player. Uh, speed is more of a GPP target. If anyone wants to take that chance, um, in a wide open type tournament like this, but to me, my favorite play in this range is probably Rory McIlroy. Uh, the perception around his game is about as bad as it's ever been after a failed Ryder Cup performance, but Fazio designs have always been kind to the Irishman in the past. Uh, Rory has gained off the tee in seven of his last eight starts on tour. Yes, he's lost in two of his three, last three with his irons, but the last two accounted to be under one shot combined. He ranks behind only Thomas when it comes to scoring at an easy track. I think he will be able to bomb and gouge. His long iron play should play nicely here since he ranks 10th in this field from 175 yards and beyond. And he grains as the number one total driver for me over a long-term sample size. Uh, so to sum this up a little bit, Rory is probably my preferred play when looking at stats and early ownership, just because you can easily pair him with another big gun, big gun and start a lineup. If you do decide to go that route, I have no issue starting with him either. Uh, Thomas, Dustin, or Xander would be the other ones that I at least have some interest in. A lot of those small decisions will come down to where these guys are actually projected and what contests I want to use them for. As I said, Spieth is the wild card dart throw, and and I'm just not going to play Morikawa. I'm a little bit different with Joel on that, but I think that was a good collective breakdown uh, from the two of us there. You know, I mean, there's a lot of information for people to digest with it, but let's continue onwards into the nine thousand dollar range and touch on any golfers that caught our attention. Once again, let's start with you, Joel. Yeah, and one thing I want to touch on, you mentioned stars and scrubs. I think it's a really good point, especially at a no cut event where people do tend to lean that way more because you can get away with. The scrubs a little bit more guaranteed four days. Um, the only caveat to that I would add is that the stars and scrub model, it starts as the model before you look at the no cut event, right? And so like, it's really designed for a week where you really feel like there's a big advantage up top, right? Like those weeks where Rom was clearly head and shoulders, the best player in the world. And was like, let's just squeeze these guys in and then get the scrubs. If you don't feel like the stars have a huge edge, I mean, you don't need to force that issue because, um, that's the real purpose of the Stars and Scrubs. So I agree with that. And one other thing I want to ask you, as we go through the breakdown, Spencer, since I know you're a Vegas guy, would you mind if as we if we pass anyone that's a Vegas guy um, that might know the course better, could you just give me a heads up? Hey, I know this guy is a Vegas guy that might might know this course better than some of the other guys. Yeah, so let's backtrack a second, I guess, based off of that. So I believe Colin Morikawa, which is going to contradict what I said, I believe this is his home course. I think he oh. has a, a home out there and uh, Xander also has some experience out there. So 
I'm not sure about everybody else, but uh, yeah, Morikawa and Xander would be the two that should have some experience out there. That is helpful. Thank you. Yes. Um, cool. So then let me, let's go look down at this nine K range. Um, you know, I think Victor Hovland's interesting, you know, in terms of like modeling and things like that, uh, because of his around poor around the green game and putting, he's probably not going to score the best here uh, that some of the other guys will. But he's one of those guys that like any week he can pop and any week he can kind of like he's very hit or miss. So from a GPP angle, I think he makes a lot of sense. Um, I do want to see where that ownership number gets to. If, if that creeps up into the mid 20s, then I want that's not there's no value in him. But if that goes down to the mid-teens, then that's somewhere I'd want to target him. So we'll see. Right now I have him just under 20. So it's like kind of in between. Um, so we'll see where that lands. But I think Hovland can be interesting here at this price point. And honestly, we're at a point now where Sam Burns, you have to play. He's been playing so well. You can't fade him. Uh, I mean, even it was almost like a disappointing tie for 14th last week, which is like tie for 14th for Sam Burns six months ago would have been priced maybe in the 7k range right now he's he's genuinely one of the best golfers uh on tour now in fairness he has been playing really well in some less loaded tournaments right not the tournaments that he's been putting up some of these scores haven't had the all the names that we're going to get this week um but he's just been playing so well i don't i don't want i'm not going to hold that against him i i like the where his game is where his form is and this is a, a perfect example of like Hey, we don't have every metric of this course and prior history. So, like, let's just go for the guy that seemed to be in unbelievable form, uh, making f his last five cups and his worst finish, which is the five tournaments ago, was tied for 21st. So, uh, I love me some Sam Burns. Uh, and at 15% ownership, which I'm seeing now, again, it's, it's only Monday. So, let's see where that gets to by Wednesday night. But at the ownership I'm seeing, I think that's way too low. So, I, I'll, I'll definitely be playing. Uh, I still have him. I've, I've kind of settled in on this narrative, and I, it's kind of gone away a little bit. But with Brooks Kepka, for me, I'm, I'm at a point where it's majors or I'm not playing him because he gets up for majors, and, like, he always disappoints outside of majors. So I'm like, all right, until you prove me wrong, I'm just going to keep fading him until he shows that he's going to get up for one of these outside major tournaments and, and, and play his game because I truly think there's a lot that goes into preparing for a golf tournament that obviously – fans don't see what these guys are doing and brooks kepka is like a celebrity he goes out he's got you know girls you see he shows up to the tournament with three beautiful women coming out of his car like i just don't think he puts in the same preparation for these non-majors as he does the majors and, and i think it's done and it shows right because you know he probably shows up he just figures i can hit it as far as anyone i'll play well and you really do need to prepare for any golf tournament to compete with the best golfers in the world so for that reason i'm sticking to that narrative until I, he's shown me he's gonna start putting in that same diligence and, and competing as much as he does in majors. I'm just going to fade him. Um, and then kind of going down to the bottom of this range. I like Tony Finau. I will play Tony Finau. He's again, another guy who's in, in good form. He, he went on a long stretch of kind of, he got cold. He wasn't really himself. I think he's back on the rise. We've seen the last three weeks. He's um, his last three tournaments. He, he won the Northern trust. Then he has two top 20s from there. So I think we're finding him. I would have liked Finau maybe a little bit less in salary, but it's 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 close enough where I think he's still someone who, who will compete on this course. The tough one for me is Sungjae. Uh, coming off of a win, uh, I try not to like, you know, I think the mistake people make is like, oh, someone won, so they're obviously in good form. Let's go play. But like how often do people win back-to-back? -back? It's rare. Uh, and guys who aren't top 10 golfers in the world with Sungjae is not tend to not get two top tens two in a row. He's price is there. I just think this is a letdown spot coming off of a big win for him. So for me, at this price, I'm probably not going to go there. Um, but, you know, I'll see. If he ends up looking like a value, if that ownership number gets under 10%, then I will. But right now it's it's, it's looking mid teen. So I don't think that, that number works for me. Um, Hideki, I'm okay with. Uh, again, he's someone where... The short game and stuff is a little concerning for a course that we think we might need to prioritize that a little bit more, but he'll have the distance. He's one of the better ball strikers. Um, the ownership looks really good in this level for on sub 10%. Um, and and the last – yeah, you know what? I, I, the bottom of the range I like. I mean, I think – I actually think all these guys are in play from 
Scheffler, who I like the least, answer the second least, but I think Usweizen and Cameron Smith, I'm very high on. Again, they both have really good short games. Um, they're both are in good form. I mean, Cam Smith just hasn't played in a while, but Usweizen came off the tie for 14th last week. Um, I don't. He's in perfectly fine form. I just think you can build a little bit. I like the way my lineups look a little bit better, prioritizing this mid to lower 9K range as my start, opposed to going up top. So those are the those are the guys that I'm really more high on up up top here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think you and I are for the most part on the same wavelength with this. Um, I mean, before I, I guess, talk about who I like here, the two players that are the biggest fades for me, which would be the one difference that we have, I don't like Hideki at 9,400, and I don't love Abraham Answer at 9,100. I just don't think that they carry the upside that a lot of people or DFS users believe that they do. I would prefer Hideki if he was like $8,500. Same with Answer. I think they're much better in that mid to low $8,000 range than the mid to low $9,000 range. Uh, I agree with your stance on Kepka. He grades out fine for me, which is you know always worth a double take with it. But like last week, he's at the Wilder Fury fight. He's Who knows what he's really doing in Vegas with it. So I'm going to just fade him until it turns the other way with it. But I really like this range also. And, and to me, there's six guys that intrigue me more than the rest. And it's everybody that you just mentioned. But Victor Hovland, Sam Burns, Tony Finau, Louis Ustazen, Cameron Smith and Scotty Scheffler. So uh, let's start with Scheffler at the bottom. So Scheffler's probably GPP only, but there is a potential massive leverage spot available after he burned the industry at TPC Summerlin. These birdie fests are still ideal for his game. I think Ustaz is playable across the board. I probably prefer him most for cash, but I have no problem playing him everywhere. Uh, Burns and Hovland are somewhere in between where you can play them in GPPs. You could use them in cash. I, I think that the playability across the board is fine. I guess the one thing I will say about Sungjae is if I was to pick a third guy that would be my biggest fade, Sungjae would be the third guy for me that would be my fade. And kind of for all the reasons you mentioned, I also don't know if this is the best uh, course fit for him. I, I think there are some similarities between TPC Summerlin and, and what we get this week, but I don't think it's necessarily as pronounced as everybody wants to make it to be. But uh, the two that graded best for me and my two favorite plays are Cameron Smith and Tony Finau. So... Fino has a ton of statistical data pointing in his favor. He ranks second in strokes gain total on bent grass, including being 19th in putting. He's a good bunker player. He has the length to take advantage of the wide open nature. And Cameron Smith was actually the top ranked golfer in my model. So um, to put that into perspective, I build my spreadsheet without DraftKings or betting prices being incorporated as any sort of a built in total towards the weight. And while that doesn't, or while that technically should provide more enhanced possibilities, since numbers are solely mine, you would be surprised how infrequently this scenario plays itself out of where a low $9,000 golfer grades as the top player. The same could be said for Sungjae last week at the Shriners, but that was a weaker field. Like I'm speaking more of these star studded events. I couldn't tell you the last time I didn't see Rom, Cantlay, Thomas, Bryson, uh, Rory, Dustin Morikawa at the top. And I know not all those players are in the field this week, but there's still enough to make it worthwhile to me that Smith is number one. Like that's a big enough point that stands out in my mind. So I know he's going to be popular, but I really like Cameron Smith. Uh, he ranks second in my model for projected bent grass scoring first in par five birdie or better first in total bunker play and third in three putt avoidance plus around the green, including being second. If we look at just uh, three putt as a solo stat. Um, the popularity around Smith, you know, as, as I said, has been high on as early as this Monday and this will release on a Tuesday, but I'm hoping it has a little bit more to do and I'll, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I was the first one to really release much information. Like I released my model early on Monday and I know people that are using things that like, there may be some people that saw it. Like I saw him originally at about 30% and now he's dropping and dropping and dropping. So it may just have been an initial buzz where everybody saw Cameron Smith. And as we get in later to the week. He ends up coming somewhere in that like 15 to 25 percent range. And in reality, in a 78 person no cut tournament, I am completely fine with that. So for me, my favorite is Cameron Smith. Uh, Scheffler probably is the best leverage spot in GPPs. I think Finau's strong across the board. I, I, I think Burns and Hovland fit into that same narrative. But uh, uh, most everybody, I mean, I guess Louis too, but everybody else is kind of just more of a plug and a play in contest. But as we jump into the eight thousand dollar tier, I will lead us off and we'll keep it short and simple here. Well, real uh, quick, okay. You made a good point that I just want to touch on. That I, I, I maybe made made a mistake, but um, I'm going to think about it. the the Hideki point is good for this reason. 
what my logic around Hideki was that, you know, he's very volatile. So but then by not having a cut, he can blow up one day and then still have four days to get one of those really low scoring days, which will help us on DK. But that logic works better for cheaper guys, not in the top two tiers. You want to use guys like that where you're more salary savers and it guarantee you some points. Up here, we need guys that can win the tournament. Uh, and, you know, if a decade blows up one day and then saves points later, it might be too little too late at the price we're paying for. Yeah, and that's kind of what my mentality is with it. Like, I would love him if he was $8,200, yeah. $8,000. And um, there is a player in the $8,000 range that I actually really like. And I think that there are some comps between him and Hideki. And I think, like, I would just rather pivot all the way down to this guy. And I'll get to him in a second. But the first guy I like is Terrell Hatton at 8400 He ranks 11th in my model for scoring at short courses and 9th in long iron proximity. Uh, that will be GPP only, but the guy I just alluded to is Paul Casey at 8,200. Uh, he's gained with his irons in 15 straight starts off the tee in seven of eight. The putter has been ice cold. It's the same problem that we get with guys like Hideki, but bent grass is his best surface historically. You know, Joel, you and I have talked about him a lot on our show uh, that we do for win daily. And we even just had the conversation now where like when Casey is in the low eight thousands, high $7,000 range. All of a sudden, that win equity that you need gets diminished drastically. And, and I wouldn't be shocked to see him provide a top 10 at sub 10% ownership. Um, I think that's kind of what you're looking for here. Like, I'm not going to have a whole bunch of players in this range. Really like the $9,000 section. I'd rather pay up there. I think that there's a lot of, or there's a couple guys in the sevens and a, and a handful of guys in the sixes. But uh, for me, it's going to be Casey. It's going to be a little bit of Hatton just as a GPP dart throw. But uh, what are you seeing? Is it me or is this range surprisingly small for this? Yeah. Uh, I don't know why they kind of, they almost felt like they didn't want to put it, but like, I felt like there's some guys even in the seven K range that they easily could have squeezed in. So it's an odd way they've done pricing because even the seven K way seven K range is a bit smaller than we would normally. Now overall, the whole tournament is smaller. It's, you know, there's a no cut event with only about, what is it? 78 golfers. Um, So that's part of it, but this still felt a little light to me. With that being said, um, you know, I, I'm with you. I think Casey's probably my favorite value in this range. And it's just like you said, if Casey was in the low 9Ks, I wouldn't have batted an eye. I would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. The fact that we're getting almost $1,000 in savings, that's the type of value that can help us. And, you know, the only thing that would have made me concerned was seeing him at 25%, which he's under 10% right now. So as long as he stays under even 15, like I'll be firing away with Casey. Uh, especially on a course that we don't have a lot of data on, and you know he's going to be a top at least 10 iron player. So, you know, that's kind of a good thing to fall back on. Um, one guy in this range you didn't mention that I, that I find pretty interesting here is uh, Harris English. Yeah. Harris is at the top of the range. Uh, he's coming off a missed cut, which I think might turn some people off. But before the missed cut, he's been pretty hot uh, playing some of his best golf. I think he can find some of that again. Um, I'm definitely in to, to roll the dice with Harris, especially in the 8K range. I think it's a really nice way to pivot and try and fill a roster of guys who we can almost do four or five golfers, 8K and 9K, and maybe one 7K and really keep a super balanced rotation. Um, other than that, I'm not going to be too heavy here. I think Hatton's English. So, I mean, sorry. I think Hatton's interesting. So I'm with you on, on that play. The only other person down here that I, that I might mention is Shane Lowry. Um, who has been in really good form. He's got four top 30s in his last four outings. Uh, another kind of guy that relies on his um, iron play, so it's pretty consistent there. Uh, but other than that, those are the main, that'll be my focus in this range. Yeah, if I look at this range, and let's just go from top to bottom on it. So if I'm trying to find a value in any iteration of my model, Harris English is a value across the board with how I ran it. Um Jason Kokrak is a value for GPPs. Now, I'm afraid that Kokrak's game may be just so far in the wrong direction at this point. I don't really love what I see with him. So I'm more going, more so probably going to be out on him. I don't love 11% for somebody that's in that's going the wrong way. Hatton's GPP only, but shows as a value. Uh, Shane Lowry, if we add a little bit more of the current form into play, he becomes a little bit of a value. Uh, Paul Casey is a value. And that is it for me. I mean, like, yeah, as you said, I mean, there's just not a whole bunch here. I kind of like picking like Paul Casey, maybe one other guy here and there and doing the exact build you just mentioned. But, uh, you know, as we move down into the $7,000 range, you said a lot of these guys, or at least some of these guys could be priced in the $8,000 range. I'm curious to hear who you thought, because I thought there were a couple also. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's some interesting ones. Right? So the first guy that comes to mind is Joaquin Neiman because we're used to seeing him there, right? And so now they're just kind of dropping his price. Now with Neiman, is he coming with the best form? Not really. I mean, it's not bad. He's making a lot of cuts, but it hasn't been too many top 20s. Um, but I think that's okay, right? These are the types of, of spots where, you know, we can take a shot on a guy like Neiman at 7,400 who we've seen he has that upside. Like, this is it's the type of play I've said this before on the other show where it's like when you look back at the week and you notice that Joaquin Neiman finished in 11th, is it in the winning lap? You're like, obviously, a Joaquin Neiman at 7,400 was a good play, right? And like, it doesn't hit you when you're looking at it now until you see the winning lap. Like, yeah, obviously, I should put him in. So that's the type of thing I'm saying. He's just a, a better pedigreed golfer than the price tag that he has. Um, similar vein, I think we've seen some really good things from Siwoo Kim. Now, this is a super volatile golfer, right? But he got, he got price adjusted way up last week, right? To the point where I was like, hard to play him at that price, but he's playing so well. He missed the cut. People came back down on him. And it kind of feels like now he might be close to forgotten about. I mean, he's still about 10% owned, so not forgotten about. But um, this is still a guy who has two uh, tied for eighth, tied for 11th, and the two tournaments before the Shriners. Um, and now it's 7,600 at a much more reasonable price. He's someone I'm willing to go back and take a shot at. Um, I would have liked Kevin Na, and but I'm just now because you know his injuries. It's just so scary. Like he can pull out of the tournament at any time, um, and I'm just I'm 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 scared because I don't know how healthy he is, and I know he's burned me before with playing him and then pulling out three holes into the tournament or something like that. So you know, I would say approach with caution. I do think he is upside. I think you know if you are willing to take that risk, I think. He could do well here, but there's definitely risk in, in rostering him. Um, I'm never one to – I don't love Justin Rose, and I never am someone that, that usually likes to go there. Going down to the bottom, I think there starts to be a big drop-off in this Edmund Kerr range where these guys start kind of leveling out. If I were to look down here toward the bottom, I think uh, Tringali could be interesting, Russell Henley, Charlie Hoffman, and maybe Harold Darner uh, or would be the, the guys I would look at toward the bottom of this range. Yeah, I think you brought up, let's start with Kevin Na, because I think Na would have made sense if he didn't just pull out of the Shriners with a wrist injury. Um, that's a problem. This this is a player who pulls out of tournaments left and right. And in a no-cut tournament, if you want to make sure you're going to lose, find the guy who's going to pull out of the tournament. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to take a shot with him, you know, be my guest. I think that there there is something to it with him, but... I don't know if I can get around the injury thing. Uh, for me, the most mispriced guy on this board is probably Joaquin Neiman at $7,400. And, um, you know, you could swap him with Tommy Fleetwood at 8800 Like, flop those two guys' price, and you'd be like, oh, yeah, Neiman's a little overpriced at 8800 and Fleetwood looks correctly priced at 7400 So I-, I think that's a really bad pricing that we can take advantage of. He ranks third in my model for total driving and 13th for three-putt avoidance. It, you know, it's not going to be all sunshine and roses, as you just mentioned, Joel, from a statistical perspective. But he has gained with his irons in 13 of 16 and off the tee in 10 of his past 12. Similar as Casey just a little bit ago, Bentgrass is his best surface. So I think that that's something at least worth taking into account with it. I like Harold Varner at 7,300. I think he's an interesting pivot off of Taylor Gooch. If Gooch is going to approach 30% ownership or 25% ownership, like that's a lot for a guy that, yes, my model likes him, but like I'm not looking to play a 25% owned Taylor Gooch in anything, really. I was going to say in a GPP, but like I don't really want to play Taylor Gooch at 25% in cash even. So. Um, that's my thought on that. My model has Alex Noren $800 underpriced from where he should be at 7,100 back to back top tens from him in his last two starts. Uh, he's never shied away from a birdie fest because of the way he can putt his proximity numbers leave something to be desired, but I do think his short game can clean up most of those mistakes. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Jason day at 7,000. So models aren't going to like him in any duration of time, unless we want to filter it to like 2015. But this is a property that does make logical sense for him to find success at if he is entering the year healthy. Wide open fairways will let him dominate off the tee. And at his best, he was one of the premier short game players in uh, the history of golf. I mean, I don't even think that that's even coming from me. I don't think that that's an outlandish comment to say. I think that is accurate with that. So I think you could do a lot worse than him as a cheap, barely owned dart throw. Um, As I said, take all of that with a grain of salt for who the source is uh, for that recommendation. But 
Uh, I, do you have anything else to say? In that I race? was going to add. I would say I would still rather play Joaquin Neiman at 8,800 over Tommy Fleetwood at the 74. Right? If you flip their prices, I'd still prefer the more expensive Neiman. So it just showed you how these prices can get, you know, there is still someone just making these prices, right? And they're not always all that accurate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. on. I think that's a really good call. The, the other thing that I was just going to add to this, to this price point is when you, when you think about kind of tiers and, and how you're going to build your tiers uh, and with like, you know, chalk and not chalk like in the upper tier and someone's chalky, it's okay to eat the chalk more because they're really good. There might be really good course fit. When someone's in a lower tier and they're chalky, that is almost an immediate fade for me because it's just not a good enough golfer to have that kind of consistency to want to put them up, you know, with that type of ownership. So like you mentioned with Gooch, he's an easy fade for me just because I don't want to eat chalk at someone at his level. And that's the problem with it. I mean, they're they're volatile golfers that are priced the way they are because they are volatile golfers. Like, I mean, it just plays in it, like the way that it plays with it. So, yeah, I think that like these and we're going to have some guys in the six thousand dollar range that we can talk about. And I just want to touch on one thing before we do move into that. My model's proper price on Joaquin Neiman was $9,100. So a uh, $1,700 difference. That was the biggest difference in my model that I could find. So uh, I would also rather play him at 8,800 if that's where he was. I think he's one of the best values on the board. But uh, yeah, let me take us home here in the $6,000 range. I'll kick it to you after I finish with this. But for me, Cameron Davis at 6,400 looks like a good course fit. Now that is going to be some ownership there. Um, I, I can understand people not necessarily wanting to go down that route, but his f current form looks good. Like I'm almost more inclined to be like accepting of that at, you know, 12 to 15%. Now, if he jumps into like that Taylor Gooch range of being 20, 25, 30%, like I'm out, but I do think at 10, 12%, you can still create a lineup with him. That makes sense. Cause the price tag is so cheap with it. Um, Stuart sink at 6,500, Matt Jones at 6,300. They're showing some value in my model. Sink might be under 1% owned with the perception around his game right now. I really like Carlos Ortiz at 6,200. I don't mind Mackenzie Hughes as a dart throw at 6,100. Irons have turned around for Ortiz as of, as of late, gaining in eight of his nine starts. Driver has seen a similar trajectory with a positive total in six of seven. Uh, there's hidden upside with him, and Hughes at least has the putting potential we saw um, you know, hit him flash recently at the U S open and the open championship. Uh, I would rather shoot for his upside ceiling when playing, uh, down in this section with it. I guess the only other guys that I would at least mention that showed up as values for me, Eric Van Royen, Brian Harmon, Patton Kazire, Jonathan Vegas is going to carry a bunch of ownership, but those were guys that were positive for me. Um, what do you like here, Joel? Yeah, I think this this range is interesting. I, like always, I think as you start getting down to the bottom of this range, it's almost like complete fade. It's hard to play any of the, the – I think there's a bigger difference this week than normal in terms of the bottom 6K range because the top of the 6K range has some playable guys, I think, that are you know maybe fairly priced if not underpriced. And so that makes the bottom of the range just look like guys that don't even belong in the same league. So I would say I'm almost at a point of like, I'm not sure what the exact number was. It was either 64 or 6,500. Anything below that is uh, 63. Anything below 63 is really not touchable here. Um, unless maybe you wanted to go with Kisner, which I could, I don't still don't love, but I could, I could get around to Kisner. Uh, then going back up to the guys, I, I'm with you on Davis. I think he's interesting play here. A guy I like a lot is Brandon Grace at 6,500. Brandon Grace is coming off, you know, a few months of the best golf I've seen in his career. Um, he, you know, he's had a bit of a run where, like, he missed the cut or he missed the cut to the Northern Trust. He was tied at 52 at the BMW, which I think might be cooling people on him. But let's not forget, he's two top 10 finishes still in his last five. Uh, and he's one of the guys that's in Exhibit A that his big weakness is off the tee, which I think can get neutralized on this course. So if you take away his biggest weakness, he's really strong everywhere else. So, I think he can be a really interesting course fit here. Um, another addition to, to, to Grace that people might overlook a little bit is if you do, if people are using a model that some for some reason takes into account tournament history, uh, it won't look good for him, but it, it hasn't been played here. So you're just taking into account how we've done on different courses, which I don't think should make a big difference anyway. Um, and then heading up to more to the top of this range, I think, uh, Kevin Streelman's in play. I have no problems with playing even Ian Poulter if you wanted to go back to that well. And uh, I don't love Keegan Bradley, but I do think he's a little bit underpriced. So if if you want to go with a 6K priced Keegan Bradley, I'd be okay with that. 
Yeah, I think some of those guys like Brandon Gracie and Poulter, I did, I think around the green will matter here a little bit. So I think all of those guys are in play for the reason that you mentioned with it. Uh, Strelman was somebody I liked last week. Um, I think you could make an argument that this, I don't want to say is a better course fit for him, but if you're going to say that like off the tee does, or, I'm sorry, if distance doesn't come into play here as much and maybe you get more of a rollout with the fairways, like Strelman could find success. He's generally a pretty good off the tee player uh, for how short he hits the ball, which is always something worth monitoring with it. But uh, I mean, I think that will do it uh, unless you have anything else to say in this range. Uh, be, I mean, before we get us out of here, I do want to play a game, but if you have any other points to make with this, uh, I'd like to hear it. Wait a minute. You meant there's a game. Oh, this, this, this is the game that you and Sia have created that we have not done in a while. So, uh, good chalk, bad chalk. Yes. Yes. I'm in. Let's do good chalk, bad chalk. All right. All right. So perfect. So if, for those that don't know, uh, Sia, Joel, and I do a game over at Win Daily on our show, which is good chalk, bad chalk. For those that have never listened, the premise of the game is simple. I'm going to read out some of the highest owned players on the board and Joel and I will take turns saying if they are good chalk meaning they are worth playing at their ownership or bad chalk being the opposite and players we might want to pivot off of in GPPs. So I'll start with you, Joel, each time, and let's run through a handful of these. So Xander Shoffley. Good chalk. I'm going to say good chalk also. Aaron Wise. Bad chalk. Bad chalk for me too. Taylor Gooch, which we've already talked about. but Bad chalk. Yeah, bad chalk. I, I just, for all the reasons we mentioned. Um, Russell Henley. Ooh. Ah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, probably bad chalk. Bad chalk for me also. I like him better at a short par 70 than uh, a par 72 that's long. Um, Louis Oostazen. Good chalk. Good chalk. I, I, as I said, I still think he's better for cash, but I don't mind him across the board. Um, Cameron Smith. Hmm. Oof, probably good chalk. I'm going to say good chalk because he's number one in my model. And so it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be almost impossible. Like unless he ends up pushing like 30, 35%, uh, I can't really find myself off of him. And I might even find a way to try to play him, which is as bad as that sounds. But if he uh, goes over 30, I'm going to, then it's bad. But if it's in the mid twenties, the high twenties, I'll, I'll still play. I mean, that's fair. Um, Colin Morikawa. If he's yeah at over twenty five, I would say bad chalk. Right now, I have him at uh, about twenty. So, if you use it as that, does that change your mind any? At twenty, I will still play him. At tw twenty five, will be my threshold. Yeah, he's going to be bad chalk for me at uh, twenty or above. Um, Victor Hovland. Ooh, ah. Uh... Oh, that's a yeah, yeah. These are some tough ones. I'm gonna say uh, Hovland's gonna be good chalk. I'm gonna say good for Hovland, and then for the last one, Justin Thomas. What number is he looking at right now? Uh, he is looking at about 17 to 18 percent. Okay. Um, I like Justin Thomas, so I'm gonna say good chalk at that number. But his his number is lower than others in that if he gets over 20, then I I would start moving toward bad chalk. Yep, good chalk for me too. I uh, I think both him and Xander are super explosive and have winning upsides. So um, I don't know 100%, but we might have had all the same answers there. We were pretty close. Yeah. So if there was one maybe off, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that will do it for us this week. Uh, Joel, I want to thank you again for coming on Be The Number. The episode was brilliant with how much knowledge you added. Um, but please tell everyone once again where they can find you and and highlight the college football show that you do for Win Daily. I know this is a golf program, but we are all sports fans, and you've been crushing it with big score after big score with that. Thanks, Ben. So you guys can find me at Draftmaster Flex everywhere. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I do try and post some plays when I can, and I do a college football stream on Friday nights. It's at 8 p.m. Uh, we've been hot. We're getting a lot of the good plays. And for those of you who love DFS and are really into it, the biggest value for the college football stuff is that not a lot of people, people do it and are getting, putting information out. So it's a way to really find an edge. Uh, and I would say it's similar to like playing some of these ancillary golf tournaments, right? Not a lot of people are, are breaking them down. So if you are and you have that information, there's a bigger edge there than there is at the Masters, which everybody plays and there's information on everywhere. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that – this goes across the board with it. This is any sport. I mean, we could say this for any sport, but 
Uh, you are the best college football person that there is out there. So definitely be sure to tune into that show. Um, you can hear Joel and I together every Tuesday at Win Daily Sports alongside C and Najad. As always, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Tiaf Sports. You can find my show, Be the Number, on each platform at Be the Number Pod. Thank you once again for everyone that has stuck with me during golf offseason. I appreciate all of your support. Good luck this week, and let's hit it big in Vegas. Thanks, Joel.